Binomial coefficients n choose k are how we count the number of ways to choose k objects out of n. Clearly, that must mean that n must be positive, right? We can choose three objects out of a total of five, but how would we choose three objects out of a total of negative five? What does that even mean? And even if we could make sense of it, why would we care? Here is the set of positive integers up to n, which we will denote as n in brackets. From this set, we can make various classes of combinatorial objects, such as a class of all subsets of n with three elements. How many objects are in this combinatorial class? Let's write a function f of n to represent it. In this case, we merely choose three out of the n integers from the set. So the number of objects in this class is just n choose three. Here's a question for you to ponder. What is the domain of this function? In other words, what values of n are allowed to be plugged into this function? In this form, most people would very reasonably say that n is allowed to be any non-negative integer. However, if I wrote out the algebraic formula for this, without the context of this being a counting problem, most people would say that the domain is a set of real numbers. So clearly, we can plug in a negative integer into f. But the interesting question is, would this result have any combinatorial meaning? Let's generalize to subsets of n with k elements. Here is our new f of n. By plugging in a negative n, it's clearly possible we could get a negative result. So let's additionally only consider the absolute value of our result. This seems like cheating, but we can't count a negative number of things. So this is necessary to get something coherent as a counting problem. This is the function that we get now, which happens to be equal to this. This seems to be a coherent expression now, but what combinatorial class would it be counting? Let's examine the answer to that. Multisets are sets in every way except for one important difference. Multisets allow duplicate elements, like these ones here. The expression we obtain counts multi-subsets of n with k elements. If it's not clear why this expression gives the right count, let's go over why. Imagine we had k identical balls to place into n distinct boxes. To get from a distribution of balls and boxes to our multiset, simply label each box with an integer from 1 to n, and each ball in a box tells us how many of that element we want in our multiset. So this distribution of the balls would give us our example multiset. We can now form a bijection between balls in the boxes and balls with n minus 1 dividers, where each of the regions between the dividers represents a box. By simply counting the orderings of balls and dividers, we also get the number of ways of distributing the balls in the boxes. The number of ways to order the balls and dividers is k plus n minus 1 choose k. This is simply choosing where we place balls and the other places are automatically chosen to be dividers. Take a minute to see if you can trace how each and every way of choosing the subset on the bottom step-by-step -step corresponds to our multiset at the top, and that every single multiset of n with k elements can be made in this way. Okay, let's recap what we just figured out. Let's name our two classes of combinatorial objects. x is the subsets of n with k elements, and y is the multi-subsets of n with k elements. We can count x using the function f of n, and we can count y by taking the absolute value of f of negative n. This is known as combinatorial reciprocity, where two different but related counting problems can be solved using the same polynomial function, where one uses positive integer inputs and the other uses negative integer inputs. And this is where we get our funky negative choose notation. If f of n can be written like this, and we know that f of minus n equals this, then why can't we just plug in a negative n in the first line and say it equals the same thing? Okay, so now we know where this weird abusive notation comes from. But why do we care to write it this way? What's the benefit in allowing our notation to be used this way when it is perfectly serviceable without it? 
There are several good reasons, but in this section, I want to show how it can be applied in an unexpected place. First, we need to lay some foundations. Let's talk about generating functions. Imagine you took a sequence of numbers, and those numbers became the coefficients of a power series, like with this example. This would be the generating function of that sequence. Generating functions, abstractly speaking, are a powerful tool in counting problems. In this video, we won't be covering how or why they're powerful, we will simply use them to demonstrate an interesting way in which we can justify this combinatorial reciprocity and one way they can be applied. Here is an example using the sequence 3 choose k. The sequence goes 1, 3, 3, 1, followed by an infinite number of zeros, giving us this generating function. It turns out that this generating function can be factored like this. That exponent of 3 is not a coincidence. If we change the 3 to any other positive integer, the exponent changes accordingly. This is simply the binomial theorem. To prove that the binomial theorem works, let's take a look at how these terms are distributed. To obtain a term, choose either x or y in each factor and multiply them together. The reason why the coefficient of x squared y squared in x plus y to the fourth is 4 choose 2 is because out of these four factors, there are four choose two ways to select two of them to be x and the other two automatically being y. Repeat for each possible term and you'll get your generating function. Now remember our combinatorial reciprocity example, where our two combinatorial classes gave us these two functions. The binomial theorem we just went over gives us the generating function for this x class, but now let's create the generating function for the y class. Let's use an example generating function and take a look at how it can be factored. At first, this looks entirely impossible, since this sequence goes on forever, and therefore so does the generating function. But we can use the same trick that we used to prove the binomial theorem. Remember that the coefficient of this term gives us the number of ways to form multi-subsets with five elements, like in our last example. Start with these infinite factors. We want the same number of infinite factors as there are integers up to n. Now let's take one of the multisets in our class, like this one. Count the number of times each element appears in our multiset, and that's the corresponding exponent in their respective factors. These give us the terms that are multiplied together to obtain one of our x to the fifth. Gathering all possible multisets in this way will give us the coefficient for x to the fifth which happens to be the number of multisets. By simply multiplying these infinite factors, we will have the generating function for our sequence, since this must be how our generating function is factored. Let's use the infinite geometric series formula to simplify these factors. This tells us that our generating function can be written in a form that resembles the binomial theorem. Just to be clear, let's recap how we handled this generating function. First, we factored it into infinite factors. Next, we rewrote those factors using the infinite geometric series formula. Finally, we simplify this expression by writing it in terms of exponents, specifically negative exponents, to make it resemble the binomial theorem. Let's now generalize n and write out our generating function. Next, since this generating function is a true identity, let's plug minus x into our x. Oh hey, that looks familiar, doesn't it? This gives us a slightly different generating function, but it is now even more recognizable as the binomial theorem. Let's compare this with our binomial theorem and equate their generating function coefficients. We do need to change our summation limits, but that's fine, because for any non-negative integers k that go beyond n, we just get zeros anyways. Let's now plug in our negative n, which not only confirms our combinatorial reciprocity, but also extends our binomial theorem to all integers n, negative or not. Remember that I said that there are many different examples of combinatorial reciprocity, and this is only one of them. To really show some of the potential power of combinatorial reciprocity, I'm going to go over several more examples, but unfortunately, due to video length, I will have to skip over their proofs. When going through this chapter, please continue to be critical and curious, 
but please don't expect rigorous justification for each and every presented conclusion. We would be here all day. My first combinatorial class X counts the number of ways to map k to n, which happens to be n to the power of k. A negative input into this function gives us n to the k again, which corresponds to the combinatorial class X. In other words, this is a combinatorial class whose combinatorial reciprocity theorem relates it to itself. Okay, maybe that was a little bit underwhelming, so the examples from here on out should be more interesting. Let's begin by defining some terminology again. Here is a graph. It's a bunch of vertices with a bunch of edges. Let's suppose that we want to color each vertex one of n possible colors. This is called an n coloring of the graph. Now let's suppose we add the condition such that vertices connected by an edge never share the same color. This is called a proper end coloring of the graph. I will additionally label each vertex with an integer between 1 and n based on the color. How many ways can I color, say, this graph? This vertex here can be colored one of n colors, while this vertex now has n minus 1 choices for colors, since it can't match the color we used. And finally, these vertices each have n minus 2 possible color choices. And so this polynomial gives us the number of ways to produce a proper end coloring for the graph. Let's say the graph is given the name g. This function is known as the chromatic polynomial of the graph g. So this motivates a combinatorial reciprocity theorem. Does plugging a negative integer into the chromatic polynomial have combinatorial meaning? We can give each edge of a graph a direction to make it a directed graph. We will now define an orientation as the assignment of each edge with a direction. So for instance, we can take our graph and give it this orientation, or this one, or this one. If you can travel along the directed edges and end up where you started, this path taken is called a cycle. A graph with no cycles is called acyclic. So now we have a coloring and we have an orientation. Let's talk about compatibility. We say that a coloring and an orientation are strictly compatible if wherever there's a directed edge, it is going from a lower numbered color to a higher numbered color. If this rule is ever broken, then they are not strictly compatible. Let's say that the colorings are called C and the orientations are called R. For any given graph, such as this one, how many pairs C, R exist, where R must be acyclic and C and R must be strictly compatible? It turns out the number of strictly compatible pairs of N colorings and acyclic orientations is exactly the same as the number of proper N colorings. In other words, the chromatic polynomial counts both of these problems. The proof of this is incredibly short. Notice that for any proper end coloring of the graph, each edge's direction is forced, so there's only one possible strictly compatible orientation we can induce. Every proper end coloring therefore corresponds to exactly one pair, and no other pairs are possible. Okay, so where's the combinatorial reciprocity then? Let's ask the question, how many compatible pairs of end colorings and acyclic orientations are there? The only difference between the previous counting problem and this one is that the pairs only need to be compatible, not strictly compatible. What does that mean? It means that edges no longer need to point to a color with a higher number. Edges may also point to a color that is equal. For example, this coloring and this orientation are not strictly compatible, but they are still compatible. This edge goes from 3 to 3, but that's okay with non-strict compatibility. This counting problem gives us our combinatorial reciprocity. A specific case of this combinatorial reciprocity is when we plug in minus 1. This means that we only have one color to use for our coloring, so every vertex is the same color, and there's only one coloring no matter what we do. This reduces the problem to only finding the number of acyclic orientations, 
This means that as long as we can find the chromatic polynomial, which counts proper n colorings, we basically automatically get the number of acyclic orientations, a seemingly entirely different counting problem. Thanks to the chromatic polynomial we found earlier, we can easily find the number of acyclic orientations of this graph, which is 18. Now let's take a look at another related combinatorial reciprocity theorem. This time, instead of counting colorings, we will be counting flows, specifically nowhere zero flows. What are flows? Start with an orientation. Instead of labeling each vertex with an integer from 1 to n, we will label each edge with an integer from 1 to n minus 1, excluding 0 if we want the flows to be nowhere 0. There is a requirement for flows. We need every vertex to have the same total flow going in as going out, so the sum of all the edges on a vertex should be 0. For instance, this vertex has 2 going into it and 2 going out of it which sums to zero. This vertex here has six coming out of it and zero coming into it, so that sums to zero. Wait, what? Doesn't that add up to six, not zero? I should mention that we are looking at the sums of the edges modulo n, meaning the remainder when dividing by n. Since I chose n to be six in this case, we can only label edges one through five, and we must add them modulo six. That's why 6 is really 0 in disguise, and also why we cannot assign 0 or 6 to our edges. So how many nowhere 0 flows are there for this orientation? Notice that there are 3 paths from the bottom left vertex to the upper right vertex. Whatever number goes up the edge must also be the same amount going right through the other edge. There are a total of n-1 choices we can make for this top path. The bottom path is the same case except we cannot assign a value that results in a sum of 0 with the top path, because then the middle edge would have to be 0. Therefore, we have n-2 choices for the bottom path. The middle edge is now forced, because it must be whatever value that cancels out the other two edges we assigned. Therefore, our flow polynomial for this orientation is n-1 times n-2. Once again, we ask the question, does f of minus n have any combinatorial meaning? We're going to skip the super technical description of this one because it gets messy, but the key takeaway is to understand that f of minus one will give us the number of totally cyclic orientations of the graph, where every edge is part of at least one cycle. This tells us that this graph has exactly six totally cyclic orientations. Hopefully, you can see the parallel concepts at work here. Chromatic polynomials give us a sneaky way to count acyclic orientations, and flow polynomials give us a sneaky way to count totally cyclic orientations. Thankfully, both chromatic polynomials and flow polynomials are pretty easy to compute algorithmically. Even better is the fact that chromatic polynomials and flow polynomials are actually intimately connected for a variety of beautiful reasons. But we will leave that subject matter for another video another day. Let's imagine I have a partially ordered set. What this means is that some of the elements of this set are ordered, but not all of them. Here's an example to really illustrate what exactly we mean by that. Let's say my set contains four elements, a circle, a square, a triangle, and a star. Now let's suppose that the circle comes before the square and also comes before the triangle. We label this by making an arrow, where the arrow points to the element that comes after. Now let's suppose that between the square and the triangle, there is no way to tell which comes before and which comes after that these two elements are not comparable. This is what we mean when we say that not all of the elements are ordered. Finally, let's say that the star comes after the square and the triangle. A set like this is called a partially ordered set, or POSET for short. 
Now the question is, how many ways can we assign each shape to a number between 1 and n such that strict order is preserved? For example, one way is to first assign the number 2 to the circle. Since the square comes after, it must be bigger than 2, so let's maybe assign it a 3. Similarly, the triangle must be bigger than 2. We can also assign it a 3 if we want to. We don't have to make it equal to the number we assign to the square, but we can. The only thing that matters is that it must be bigger than whatever number is assigned to the circle. How it compares to the square doesn't matter, since those elements can't be compared in the original poset. Finally, we need to select a number for the star, as long as that number is bigger than both the square and triangle. Let's pick 5 here. This would be one way of assigning integers to the poset. Here's another way to assign numbers. Now let's write a polynomial based on n that counts the number of ways of assigning the integers 1 to n to the poset. For time's sake, I'm going to shortcut straight to the polynomial, but pause right now if you want to try finding it yourself for this poset. Alright, here is the polynomial. Polynomials that count the number of order-preserving mappings of posets are called order polynomials. Let's once again ask the central question of combinatorial reciprocity. Does f of minus n have combinatorial meaning? It turns out it does. f of minus n counts the exact same thing except instead of preserving strict order, we only need to preserve weak order, meaning that arrows are not required to point to larger numbers, they can also point to equal numbers, like in this poset mapping here, or this one here. Go ahead and try this out for some smaller values of n, and see if the function values are correct. Take a look at this triangle. Let's give this shape a name. Let's call it s. I will now introduce the following notation. I can multiply a positive integer to s, and that would be the scaling factor. Specifically, each point x, y on this shape would be moved to the point nx and y. So for example, this shape is s, this shape would be 2s, this shape would be 3s, and so on. This leads us to the following counting question. In terms of n, how many points lie strictly in the interior of ns? To be clear, when we say strictly inside a shape, we mean that it cannot be on the border, on the edges. It must be entirely inside the shape. For this shape in particular, you can see that there are exactly three points inside 4s, so whatever function we find for f, we know that f of 4 must be 3. Once again, we will jump ahead to the polynomial answer. Here is our f of n. Polynomials that count the number of points that lie inside a polytope, which is the word for a polygon of any number of dimensions, including 3D polyhedrons are called Earhart polynomials. One more time, we ask the central question, does f of minus n have combinatorial meaning? In this case, f of minus n counts the number of points that lie on or inside s, which includes the points on the border. We don't need the points to be strictly inside, they only need to be barely inside. For example, plugging in minus 3, we get the number of points on 3s, which is 10. What is truly amazing about this relationship is that this combinatorial reciprocity theorem applies to all Earhart polynomials, which means that this even works for arbitrary polytopes, polygons in any number of dimensions. So let's recap what we learned and why we care about combinatorial reciprocity. Firstly, all of the examples of combinatorial reciprocity theorems that we covered can actually be unified in a very beautiful and amusing way, if you consider them as problems in multidimensional geometry. I'd love to go over more on this subject, but it would need to be in a separate video, maybe several videos due to length. But in the meantime, you can abstractly get a little glimpse into the commonality between all these examples. The pair of combinatorial classes in any combinatorial reciprocity theorem are related in the same way that these two symbols are related. One of them counts the boundary while the other one doesn't. Whether it's color assignments of vertices, flow assignments of edges, poset mappings, 
or lattice points and polytopes, one combinatorial class ignores the boundary condition, while the other one counts it. Secondly, combinatorial reciprocity allows us to sort of extend the domain of the math objects we're working with, just like how we, for instance, allow speed to be negative by incorporating direction and calling it velocity, or by extending our real functions to complex functions. Talking about a negative number of objects is just as nonsensical as talking about an i number of objects. But this isn't the best way to understand these extensions. We reimagine complex numbers by interpreting them as two-dimensional points, just as we reimagine these negative combinatorial inputs as their combinatorial reciprocity theorems. We're not actually choosing from a negative number of things, we're simply counting a related class of combinatorial objects. And finally, the big reason why we care about combinatorial reciprocity. This is more than just a notational gimmick. Most importantly, combinatorial reciprocity theorems tell us that by solving one combinatorial problem, we get the other one for free, on the other side of the number line. If x and y are both combinatorial classes connected by a combinatorial reciprocity theorem, no matter how difficult it may be to figure out how to count y, as long as you know how to count x, how to count y is automatically given to you for free. I wish I could go over all the proofs to these theorems, or the applications of these concepts, but this is already a very long video. Ultimately, I decided that the most important thing I wanted to share was the elegance of combinatorial reciprocity in general. Hopefully, I gave you enough of an overview to show how we can acknowledge the formal existence of negative binomial coefficients and the beauty of recognizing combinatorial reciprocity. If you would like to learn more, I've linked a resource in the description that goes into everything in this video in much more detail and rigor, with a ton of exercises to try on your own. And here I pose some questions for you, the viewer. What combinatorial reciprocity theorems can you find? Can you find some applications of these ideas in other problems, whether they are other math problems or something in the real world? Beyond the scope of this video in general, can you find any other ways to extend the domains of other math objects?